I invite you to remain seated and please join me in the invocation and confession and forgiveness. We begin our worship this evening in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are comfortable and join in our gathering song. Yes. 
you come all things that are good. Lead us by the inspiration of your Spirit to know those things that are right, and by your merciful guidance, help us to do them. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading is from Isaiah 5. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a vine that in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I had not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It will not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice but he saw bloodshed, righteousness, but he heard a cry. Here ends the first reading. The psalm is Psalm 80, and we will read it responsibly. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine upon us, and we shall be saved. You, you have brought my apologies. You cast out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered by its shadow, and the tower was steered to you by the cloud. You stretched out its tendrils to the sea and its branches to the river. Why, Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by? The wild boar of the forest has ravaged it, and the beasts of the field have grazed upon it. Turn, Turn now, O God of hosts, look down from heaven. Behold and tend this vine. Preserve what your right hand has planted. The second reading is from Philippians 3, and Paul writes, If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet, whatever gains I have, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. 
More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus had, has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straying forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Here ends the second reading. Please stand as you're comfortable for the gospel acclamation. Is from the Gospel of Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said to the people, Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these tenants? They said to him, he will put the, those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing. And it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard this parable, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowd because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. I gave some thought this week about What's important in life? What do we prioritize? What do we strive for? And then I started thinking 
That's changed a lot when you stop and think about it. When we were children, we were looking for our next playtime. We were looking for our next toy. We were looking to learn to ride a two-wheel bicycle instead of a tricycle. Things were simple, and we took those steps. As we grew older, okay, in and through education and encouragement, we went on to vocations, what we would probably do for the bulk of our lives. Or more schooling, on to careers. So we go to a job, we go to a career. And at some time, these things tend to surround us and overpower us at times. They become the center of who we are, that we strive for excellence in all these things. Now make no mistake, there's nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, I believe that God created us to aspire to be the best that we can at whatever it is we do. But when that becomes the priority in our life, something always suffers. As a young man, I didn't understand that because like many people and maybe like you, I suffered a great deal from what I refer to as the power of youth. And that was, was whatever was in that sphere was the most important thing. That was the thing that, that just was. That was why I was there. And along with it came a bit of self arrogance. That somehow or other I was in control of it all. Well, there were many times I found out that I wasn't. But the lesson in learning what truly is important in life really didn't start to change until a time where it was something simple told to me by someone that I knew but didn't know well. And isn't it amazing that when we go through life, people that we have a great deal of contact or little contact, there's little sound bites and little pieces that somehow or other, metaphorically speaking, hit us right in the forehead and maybe even leave a mark. Well, this was one of those times. I had been married for 10, 15 years, was looking to do something different and was contemplating selling my home. Now, selling that home, it, it bore its own weight because it was my family's homestead. And somehow or other I felt in here that I was obligated to trudge on and own that piece of property, no matter what, that that somehow or other was supposed to be the most important thing. So I had the father of a good friend of mine who was very successful in real estate come out and give me his idea of what my property was worth. And he went through everything and he looked at me and he said, what are you thinking? And I threw him a number and he said, yeah. He said, I think you're there. Okay. And he said, you look like you've got a problem. And I said, yeah, I do. He said, what's the problem? He said, I said, my great grandfather homesteaded this. That's the problem. Now, before I tell you what he said, I want, to re I want to just interject something. It was months before this, he suffered from a massive stroke. And he rehabilitated miraculously. If you did not know him before and you saw him at this point, there were only subtle differences that would tell you that he had a medical issue. But if you hadn't met him before, you really wouldn't know. But you could see in his face and in his eyes that that was an eye-opening thing for him because this was someone that was very, very, very successful. That all that was important was the next deal. And he looked at me and he said, well, he said, I don't know if this will help or not, but he says, take this from personal experience. He said, everything that we own in this life is going to end up in two places. Someone else is either going to own it or it's going to end up in a landfill. 
Because he said, the one thing I've learned the hard way is, is that we're not taking any of it with us. He was speaking of worldly things. And his near-death experience tend to put things into priority, into perspective for him. And a young man in his mid-30s that had struggled with that, all of a sudden, I never forgot those words. And they continue to be clearer and clearer and clearer as time goes on. The only thing that he was missing, not knowing that if he was a religious man or a man of faith, was that there is one thing that we do take with us that is non-perishable, and that is Christ. In today's epistle, in Paul's letter to the Philippians, he said, if anyone has any reason to boast in the flesh, I do. Look at all the things that I've accomplished in life. Look at all the things that I accomplished in life. Everything that he was expected to accomplish in life. He was a member. He was an Israelite. He was a member of the tribe of Benjamin. And just a little history lesson. Those were the two tribes that survived. Whereas all of the rest went off into an obscure existence. He was a Hebrew born of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And in his own admission of his zeal for the law, he even admits to being a persecutor of the church. That at one point in his life was very important to him. And in the next stage of his life, he had to ask forgiveness for and trust that forgiveness. But in all these things, in all of his accomplishments, in all of who he could have been in this and that earthly world at that time, he chalked up as loss. That it meant nothing in comparison, in comparison to knowing his Lord Jesus Christ. That this was the one and most important thing, the forefront of everything that he did. He took the time to explain this to the Philippians in the letter, but the point was is that his very existence lived and was driven through his Lord Jesus, through the love of Christ, born out and created in the blessing and the gift of faith from God the Father through our Lord and Savior. This is what drove him. This is what made his ministry what it is. Like our Lord, this is one of the reasons why he's one of three or four apostles that makes up so much of the writings in the New Testament. Is because that was first and foremost in his life. A man who thought he had it all figured out and thought he had everything that life could give found out that everything that life gave meant nothing. If he did not have Christ, that Christ was the most important thing. And I can't, I can't lose his words when he says that I leave and I let everything that is behind behind, and of course I'm preparing, paraphrasing now, but that I boldly go forward in the name of Christ for that heavenly pride in and through our Lord Jesus. Because that doesn't die. That doesn't perish. That is something that we hold on to in the promise of the resurrection in and through our Lord Jesus. We live life in and through what comes next. In the glory of God. And it makes everything around us pretty much put in its place. So we go forward from today. I wrote a little letter, a little op-ed this week, sent it out, about how our lives have changed. I had a conversation with a friend just three or four days ago, and he said, you know, he said the hardest thing about all of this is, he said is that it's, it's literally tore, tore the social fabric of our, of our neighborhoods of our states, of our country, and of our world. 
because there's a growing anger and uneasiness about not being able to do what we once did or thinking that things will never be the same and this will never be here again. And unfortunately, that may well be the case. I believe there will be those things that will become comfortable again and that will become normal. But it is knowing that the one thing that won't change, the one thing that's always there is the love of God in and through Christ. And that Christ is not sitting watching us in this turmoil and in this transition. Christ is standing right alongside of us and walking right through it with us. But we too may have to look behind and say we need to leave that there. And we may need to move forward in a different way for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of others within our community and for the sake of others around the world. We may need to do that. But more importantly, it puts all of the things around us, including our very material things in perspective that says, yes, we need to live. We need, to, we need to take care of ourselves so that we in turn can help take care of others. But we do so in and through the love of God and in and through our Lord Jesus. That's forefront. That's eternal. That doesn't perish. That's not going to end up in a landfill. And it will be owned by others because there's plenty there. But it's something we can hold on to, something we can trust, and something that we can go forward in boldly, even though we may need to leave things in the past. We can go forward knowing things will be different, but in and through the Holy Spirit, the love of God, the sacrifice, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. It will be glorious. And it is yours. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are comfortable and join in our hymn of the day.
us confess our faith in the words of the Apostle Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God, the Son of God, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for our church, the world, and all those in need. Each prayer petition ends with the words Lord, in your mercy, and your response is, hear our prayer. Holy God, you call us to work for peace and justice in your vineyard. Refresh the church with your life that we may bear bear fruit through work and service. We pray especially for this church, Shepherd of the Lakes, and for our pastor, Brother Bill, that you, Lord, may direct his steps deeper in and higher up. And we pray especially for our younger generations, that you, Lord, will touch and call them to yourself by quickening your spirit within them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for the abundant harvest of the church. Bless and care for those whose hands bring the fruits of the earth to the tables of all who hunger. May we be inspired by your servants who care deeply for your creation especially St. Francis of Assisi, whom we commemorate today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Curb the impulses of greed and pride that lead us to take advantage of others. Grant that world leaders especially seek the fruits of the kingdom for the good and welfare of all people. We pray for our President and First Lady that you, Lord, will be their healing and enlightenment. And for all those dealing with sickness and grief during this pandemic, hear our prayer, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Sustain all who suffer with the promise of new life. Assured of your presence, heal our pain and suffering and equip us to embrace all bodies, seeking for wholeness of mind, body, and soul. We call to mind those who are struggling today, especially those listed in our bulletin and those dear to our hearts, which we mention either silently or aloud. For Kevin. For Kevin. Steve and Kim. For Jeff, Kathy, and Brittany. For Dave. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We pray for all managers in all community and for all who seek employment. Give hope 
and the future to those who lack meaningful work, those who have been marginalized or abused in the workplace, and those who desire new opera opportunities. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for the saints who teach us and have taught us to live faithfully in your vineyard. May our chorus join theirs until our labor is complete. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray. In the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 The peace of the Lord be with you always. I invite you to be seated, but turn and greet your neighbor with a wave.
and so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
stand as you are comfortable. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which you have now received, strengthen and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. And in your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you all now and forever. Amen. I invite you all to join in our sending song. Thanks be to God.